The following broadcast, Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, is made possible, thanks in part, from the support of Wilbur Hot Springs, a health sanctuary and nature preserve located in Calusa County, California. As many of you know, for half a century, Wilbur has been a place for me to rest, replenish, heal, and create. Wilbur is off the grid, situated in an 1,800-acre nature preserve. For over 100 years, the slogan of Wilbur is, in all the world, no waters like these. This year especially, it's vital to take time to unplug, to be with prescription-grade RXN, prescription-grade nature. I suggest that unless you are in a vehicle, step away from your devices, take a deep breath, imagine Wilbur's natural medicine, warm waters enveloping you, visit wilberhotsprings.com and book your stay. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health and Politics. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lewis Miller. The mission of Mind, Body, Health and Politics is to stimulate thought, expand consciousness and encourage community. Stay tuned for what I'm confident will be a conversation worth listening to, and for some of you participating in. To participate, call in at 650-TALLY-HO. That's 650-TALLY-HO. For close to 20 years, I've hosted broadcasts and brought listeners people of high integrity, be they scientists and sex workers, authors and artists, patients and doctors, unknowns and famous. I've asked questions, hopefully, hopefully with kindness of tone, the answers to which give listeners information, knowledge, and sometimes wisdom. Today, we have a truly challenging situation to resolve. This broadcast spins around a controversy regarding a virus protection tactic, masking, during a global pandemic. Over 10 million people in the United States are infected with COVID-19, and over 250,000 Americans have died. Our situation passes the three criteria of being a country at war. We are being invaded. Two, the invaders are injuring people. Three, the invaders are killing people. To eliminate the microscopic COVID-19 invader, we must stop its transmission. Stop the transmission of COVID-19 and it ceases to exist. I trust you'll sign on and join me in this national war, but if you wanna sit this one out or perhaps watch from hopefully a safe distance, it is your right. Remember one third of America sat out our American revolution and we still defeated England, which at that time had the strongest army in the world. However, you cannot sit this war out completely and be allowed to spread disease. We must have a high percentage of cooperation to win this war. It's much too early to tell what percentage of us are immune, what percent vulnerable, what are the acceptable parameters of duration and intensity, how long COVID-19 lives in a variety of surfaces, or why the money supply and the mail are not considered COVID conveyor belts. Honest answers to these questions require that scientists have the time and resources to do their scientific research. Then we must listen to what the scientists report. It's essential that scientists are allowed to work in an agenda-free atmosphere. Instead, our current American president has politicized science by attempting to sway the scientists as well as push them to a vaccine and bring it to market. As a result of science being undermined and politicized, only 58% of the American public are presently ready to get vaccinated. And with good reason. How can the public trust pharmaceutical companies that allow themselves to be swayed by profits and politicians? Some good news is that more is known about treatment and the mortality percentage is presently decreasing. Infection fighting tactics offered to the public in words, but not always with the needed supplies, vary from state to state, and the list includes testing, 
contact tracing, masking, social distancing, hand washing, isolating, quarantining, and building the immune system with nutrition, supplements, and exercise. Presently, what is most readily available to the largest number of people are masking, social distancing, hand washing, and immunity building. It is masking which we will primarily discuss today. The issue of masking has become hopelessly politicized over the past nine months. As you all know, it has been difficult for the American public to obtain information they can trust regarding masking because the president politicized the wearing of masks and thus not wearing a mask was seen as supporting the president and those wearing them were seen as not going along with their own president. The president made a potential virus protection tactic, a referendum on his personal popularity. In sum, instead of the decision to wear or not wear a mask being based on science, the decision for many became one of, do I support the president or not? Some researchers believe that tens of thousands have contracted the virus as a result of their allegiance to the president's anti-masking policy. Let us now listen to the scientists. Today, we have with us researchers from two of the most highly publicized research projects on the efficacy of masks. Dr. Eric Charles Westman, Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University. He is board certified in obesity medicine and internal medicine. He was one of America's first champions of masking as a means to curtail the spread of coronavirus 19. Working with a local nonprofit, he provided free masks to at risk and underserved populations in the greater Durham community. But he needed to know whether the virus blocking claims mask suppliers made were true. He wanted to be assured he wasn't providing ineffective masks that spread viruses with false security. So he turned to science. He turned to his colleagues in Duke's Department of Physics. Could someone test various masks for him? This led to the world famous research referred to as the Duke study, which he will tell us about today. This study confirmed Dr. Westman's belief in masks. We also have with us Dr. Henning Bungard, professor, senior consultant in cardiology at the University of Copenhagen. He was the lead researcher of the equally famous mask research known as the Denmark study, which involved over 6,000 people in the real world. While the Denmark study brought inconclusive results about the efficacy of masks, Dr. Bungard has been quoted as saying, even a small degree of protection is worth using the face mask because you are protecting yourself against a potentially life-threatening disease. By the way, the name of Dr. Bungard's study is the effectiveness of adding a mask recommendation to other public health measures to prevent SARS-CoV-19 infection in Danish mask wearers. In addition, we have the privilege of having with us today, Dr. Nicholas Cozy, some of you remember him from last week, internationally recognized psychopharmacologist who does research and teaching at the University of Wisconsin. Again, we also have Creon Levitt, retired from a distinguished 35 years, years as a rocket scientist with NASA, and now director of spacecraft research and development at Planet Labs in San Francisco. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics, gentlemen. We're going to start, Dr. Westman, with you. You heard what I said. You know that's the accurate truth of what happened. If you want to correct me, if I said anything that was not exactly accurate about how, what motivated you to start the, uh, the Duke study, please do. Tell us about your study it let us, and do it in such a way that our listeners can follow and understand what your famous Duke study was about. 
Excellent. Well, as you mentioned, uh, we were faced with a community shortage of masks in our area back in the early part of 2020. We were faced with quality control, basically. There were all of these masks being made in the community and we didn't know if they were as good as other masks or whether they did much at all. We saw a brief letter to the New England Journal of Medicine where a group at NIH used a very simple laser system to show particles coming out of the mouth and sneezing and, and coughing, and, and, but they didn't really test masks. But we thought, why don't we use a similar simple sort of laser system to look at particles, however they were going to be generated, and see if masks could stop those particles. So what we ended up doing is going to the basement of the physics department. <laughs> so this is a, a, in a lab sort of situation, but the uh, setup was, I, I was one of the participants. So I would be speaking in front of a box that was black, a dark box with a laser going through it so that you could see the laser light and the box. And if, if I was breathing in front of this hole in the box, there was no particle being generated into the box. You could actually see it. And so when I started and we developed a, just a speaking uh, sentence, we said, stay healthy people five times, stay healthy people, stay healthy people. The particles started filling up the box. So just breathing there didn't, there wasn't, wasn't any particle generation from our mouths. But when we, were speaking just in normal voice like this, the particles started coming out into the box and you could see them visibly <laughs> with the laser. Now, the science part was the replication over and over and over and doing an an analysis with a fairly sophisticated iPhone detection of the particles with the automated analysis of it. And so we had multiple people do the same thing but I was struck by how little I had to do to start spreading particles. And uh, you know how far they go, we didn't test, we, but we, we found is that with four different people in front of this box, we all started spewing particles in, out of our mouths by just talking. And so at, at hand, we had about 14 different masks that were being used in the community. We were handing them out and we tested whether putting the masks on, so it wasn't just testing fabric, it was testing the masks on people, whether that would block the particles from getting into this black box where the laser light was. So we tested the N95s, the surgical masks, the uh, polypropylene masks that a local man mattress factory was making. We tested a kind of sock mask and a bandana and a gator mask, which were single layers. And I mean, I could just see visibly with my eyes that when I put a bandana on, there were still particles going into this box. Uh, when we had that single layer gator, there were still visible particles with a laser into the box. But as you got more layers and more uh, polypropylene and surgical masks and N95, that basically totally blocked the particles that were coming out of our mouths uh, just by speaking. So. Of course, what, like the telephone game where you don't have control of the last message that gets out, the message got out that gators don't work and there was a, a whole hue and cry. But no, the main point of the, the article and, and the method is that you could really see this simply with a laser in a box so that the method can be replicated over and over and over. It doesn't cost much to do this. And then the what was new, we knew that sneezes and coughing can spread particles, but hardly anyone knew that just speaking can spread particles. And now we know as time has progressed that virus particles are in the saliva, they're in the respiratory secretions and tests for the virus are using saliva and nasal swabs. So the virus is in saliva. And this we think is one of the main ways that this very contagious disease gets spread to other people. So when I go out and about and watch people close or even six feet away without masks and they're talking really loud, I, I now have this 
in my mind that they're spewing particles that they can't see. If they only had a laser to look or if they only knew what I knew. Uh, so I think I kind of came into this knowing that masks can block. I mean, I'm a, I'm a physician. I've been in surgery in operating rooms where we, we mask up and gown. And, and I know that if you're taking care of someone with COVID-19, you have full PPE on and then throw it away. Um, we're talking about community use of a mask. And we now know that it doesn't have to be perfect. Of course, the better mask, the more protection you give yourself and the protection you give from the particles when you speak, uh, uh, you don't spread those particles to other people when you're wearing some sort of face covering. So I think the, the novelty it was that we did a very simple laser uh, sort of analysis uh, method. I wanna ask you a quick question, if you don't mind, Dr. Westman. Of you've course. Used, you've used the word particles a number of times. I think in multiple contexts, but I'm not sure. There's virus particles, which are what, like 10 nanometers or a few tens of nanometers in size. Surely. And then there's and then there's other particles, like the ones that are coming out of your mouth when you're speaking in the box, but you don't have a disease, right? So can we maybe talk about the spectrum of particles and kind of how that fits in with the masking and the and the the proposed modes of transmission? Right. So the laser that we use uh, allows you to see small particles, not to the degree of a virus, though. Mm -hmm. And it makes visible a certain, um, you know, the, the nomenclature is a little um, loose. The, you talk about droplets and then particles. And, and when you, um, uh, yeah, you know, I'm sure you've seen that when you speak loudly, sometimes there are visible droplets that come out of your mouth. Uh, these are not visible with the naked eye, but they are visible with the laser. And I think it's pretty much consensus view that virus particles are spread on these droplets, not by just virus particles themselves going around in the air. They have to be on something. Uh, so the, the nomenclature is a little, little tough, but the very small to particles to droplets that you can see it somewhere in the middle there. Any other questions for Dr. Westman? Can you hear me, Nick? Yes. Okay, good, it's working again, that's great. Well, there has been a lot of controversy uh, as you, oh, one second. Uh, Dr. Bungard, please go ahead. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think what what you told us, Westman, is very interesting, and, and there are some um, interpretation of what masking is actually doing for us. When we are talking about surgical face masks, then we are taught that they have a filtration rate of 98%, or we talk about at a less than 95% filtration rate. And I think for most of us, uh, not least physicians, it comes as a surprise that this filtration rate is based on measurements of staphylococci, uh, the number of staphylococci that passes through the mask. That is, in the laboratory, you set up and you kind of pump uh, staphylococci in air through the mask, and then only 2% uh, are allowed to go through if it's a 98% uh, mask. But considering that the virus is one tenth of the size of a staphylococci, uh, then this may be a problem when wearing a mask for protection against the virus, unless you keep to the concept of uh, considering that it's mostly droplets uh, more than aerosols that uh, the virus might be in. I, I, I agree, um, uh, Westman, that we, we probably don't have free virus in the air, but virus could be to other uh, small particles uh, with aerosol uh, size being below five micrometers. Uh, and the problem is they might go through the mask or they may circum uh, circumnavigate the, uh, the mask, uh, really making a problem. So we probably have droplets uh, as well as uh, aerosols uh, that may contain uh, viruses. Were the, 
were the droplets that you were measuring uh, the same number of microns as the COVID-19 uh, virus? No, they were much larger than the COVID-19 virus. Uh, much larger meaning the droplet size. Now with the measurement apparatus we had, the laser, we, we couldn't actually tell you the exact size of the droplets. They were of different, but we counted the, the number and the volume of them. Uh, so again, this is not the be all end all uh, to portray to the precision that you probably want, but it gave the, you know, the um, face validity, the obvious blocking of particles by something as simple as cloth masks. And um, so I don't know exactly the particle size. Understood. Um, if I could make a comment, uh, to my knowledge, the viruses themselves are 50 to 200 nanometers in diameter. And so when we were talking about micron sized uh, filters, we're, we're looking at something that's perhaps 50 fold bigger than that. So these droplets, these aerosols that contain the viruses are at least an order of magnitude larger than the virus itself. And I agree, I mean, from what I've learned that the, it's not free viruses that are being spread, but rather these aerosols as a vehicle to uh, spread the virus. So then what do we conclude with regard to the ability of say an N95 or three layers of cotton to stop an actual um, molecule coming out uh, or a water molecule coming out with a, a, a COVID-19 piggybacking on it? <laughs> well, I'll go first. Please. I think when you're using a mask in the community setting, you're probably not coming into contact with the virus all that frequently. So it's different than using a N95 or full PPE inside a hospital room where someone is spewing out the virus into the air and you know you're gonna be exposed. In that case, you not only wear a mask, you wear face coverings, you wear full gowns and gloves and you don't want any exposure. So when you're in the community setting, you don't need a perfect mask. And this is a, a very difficult concept to get through to people. Well, then why do I need to wear a mask at all? Well, because when you are around other people, you may have the infection and not know it and spread it to other people. And then when you are around other people, you may be exposed to other people's particles that are coming around and any blockage of it. So it's not like you're, you're uh, having a water going through the mask and you have to stop all the water. It's like they're little droplets every now and then that you just want to have like a, a karate chop to keep it away. I mean, so it's interesting that you have to match the, the protection, the PPE to the environment that you're in and you don't need a perfect blockage when you're out in the community. I understand what you're saying, but you heard what I said during my introduction about duration and intensity, and that's in somewhat what you're referencing right now. But there really we're talking about two different uh, directions. And the direction you're talking about is how much is in the atmosphere around you that's going to be coming in. And there's a difference between a hospital setting, obviously, and somewhere out in, in, a, in a supermarket. But we also have the other side of that, which is a person who is symptomatic and carrying the virus. And how much does the mask let through it going the other way? And in that particular case, I think the ability of the mask to be a filtering system is, is uh, certainly as critical because that one person in an elevator, for example, or in a, in a, in a conference room, uh, if we don't have a, a filter that'll stop um, uh, the particular size of the water with the COVID-19 piggybacking on it, we, we lose, right? We've got to have something that'll do that. Yep, that's a great point. And that was one of the twists and, and turns in our research as we were getting into it is we tested an N95 mask that had an exhalation valve without a filter on it. And so that mask with a, with a valve did not do well in blocking the particles from coming out of the mouth. It, that's a good point. Uh, Dr. Bungard? Uh, you know, there have been other uh, studies looking at uh, the efficacy of the mask as 
source control. That is when the mask is worn by a person who is infected. And in these studies, uh, laboratory studies, uh, people with a mask on, an infected person with a mask on have been talking loud as you did in your uh, study, Westman, or they have been coughing or sneezing. Uh, and then they have, then uh, measurements have shown a lot of virus on the inside of the mask, a lot of virus on the inside of the mask, meaning that the mask stopped a lot of the virus and the virus sitting on the inside of the mask certainly is not going to uh, infect other people uh, in the surroundings. So I think that's a very strong indirect evidence of the efficacy of the mask as source control. And that has to be uh, considered. And I think that is a very logic uh, way of uh, seeing it as well. That's a good point, Dr. Bungard. And it also, as good a point as it is, also makes it even more complicated for the average person. Because if they're listening carefully to what you said, they now have to make some kind of decision as to how often they replace their mask or how often they figure out a way to clean it, don't they? Whereas in, in Dr. Westman's case, he made it clear, he finishes a procedure at, at the hospital, he throws away the mask, he, there's no issue, he's not saving it. But I see people, and we all know people all the time, they, they can't afford to just be using a mask, throwing it away, using a mask, throwing it away. And it, it is somewhat incumbent upon science, upon us, to tell them something about how often do they replace or how often do they wash or can they wash? Can they clean it? I'd like to just go into that for a moment uh, for, to all four of you. To what extent, let's say people have the N95, some combination. They have an N95, a KN95, which we haven't talked about, which I believe is the Chinese version of the N95. And then they have say three, they've read the study and they know to do three layers of cotton, okay? What do we tell them about how often to either wash, change, can the, and they're asking, can an N95 be washed or does washing deteriorate it? So we have that question. Give me yeah, some this, is, this is Eric, uh, Eric Westman. I don't yeah. think we have data to to go by with this. I mean, Duke did a study looking at uh, sanitation of N95s using uh, a procedure for hospital use. But for the community side, uh, you know, I'm left with hanging up the mask when I go home, letting it air out. And, and you know, every few days, if, if it becomes soiled or, or if I drop it on the floor or something, uh, I, I wash it. Uh, but then I use a combination of a surgical mask with a, a cloth mask over it because I, again, I sat in front of a box with a laser and I saw that the surgical mask was almost as good as an N95. And, and so I, I kind of use a, a cloth mask as a cosmetic <laughs> cover over the, the mask. I mean, and if you look at some of our politicians, you'll see that there's kind of a double layer that I, I'm not sure where, uh, but then if you see some other people, they're going around with these face shields with no filtration at all, which makes no sense to me, somehow they're getting that advice. But uh, I think, um, I, I thought by now everyone would be wearing just that, you know, 50 cent surgical mask uh, and throwing them away uh, as they need. But um, I don't think we have good guidance on how often to, uh, to launder our masks. Dr. Bungard? I most certainly agree with Dr. Westman. Uh, this is uh, tricky. Uh, the, WHO recommendations were that you can, in the hospital uh, situation, you can wear a mask for three hours. And during the spring, I think they had a brief period where they said it could be used for up to eight hours. And now they recommend no more than four hours. During the spring, it was because of the shortage, I guess. Um, and, you know, that depends on that you are really, really careful the way you are managing or handling your mask. And I think that if I wear a mask, then I should consider that if it had, if the mask has been working, then there's sitting virus on the mask on the outside, or if I'm ill on the inside. So I should really, really be careful. And we have to, to teach and remind each others that we should be so careful. We cannot just take a, a, 
a mask and fold it and put it in the pocket. We, that would be to put your fingers on the coronavirus that potentially sits on the outside or the inside. We shouldn't do that with putting it into the uh, pocket and take it off again several times. And that's it, independent of its surgical face masks or its cloth masks. We shouldn't uh, do that. Uh, and I think that we have data on the efficacy of, of um, uh, surgical face masks and N95, uh, but not on, on uh, cloth masks. Or the data here are uh, harder to uh, interpret. Uh, so, and, 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 and also I have to say N95, that is not for community. Uh, in my opinion, at least, uh, it's too hard to wear a N95 mask. Uh, yes, if you are sitting uh, still, but if you are walking or doing anything physically, you can't use that, uh, that kind of masks. Uh, but my, my, my idea here is we have to be very, very careful how, to, how we're uh, handling the masks. And what I see is, you know, in the pocket and on the table next to you when eating or where other people are eating, um, that's not the way to do it. Then well, we may lose all the benefits. Dr. Bungard, please tell us, you heard Dr. Westman say what he does. Uh, I'm going to ask him some more about what he does. Please tell us exactly what procedure you personally follow with regard to mask wearing. Uh, you know, due to the mask study, I have a surplus of several thousand masks. So I have the, uh, I can use a lot of masks and I, and I use a lot of masks. I never ever take on the same mask twice. I just simply don't do it. Uh, so I take only the ear loops and I only touch the ear loops. Uh, I don't touch the, the mask in front of my face. And when I take it off, I put it into the bin uh, right away. It's not put on tables or in other places. Uh, then we may certainly lose all uh, the benefits of wearing the mask. So you're really cautioning everyone with regard to contamination of the mask itself, uh, in addition to its being a filter for inflow and outflow. Yeah, contaminating the mask, but also contaminating your own fingers, because these fingers are going into your nose or your eyes uh, or your mouth, uh, or you are putting the fingers on something that, uh, you know, on a doorknob where there's another person uh, five uh, seconds later touching the same uh, doorknob and then he is maybe infected. We have to be so careful. Do you have a recommendation, Dr. Bungard, for what people might do who don't have access the way you do to hundreds <laughs> to thousands of masks? Because that's what people listening are saying to themselves. They're saying, hey, this guy is in great shape. He's got thousands of masks, but I don't. I've got maybe five or 10, or maybe I'll go to Amazon and see what I can get. But yeah. they really want to know, what yeah. do I do? You know, we need to, and by the end of this program, I really want us to come up with some kind of message to the public of what should they do right now? Not tomorrow when maybe there'll be more something, not in a few months when maybe there'll be a vaccination, but what do they do after listening to this program? Because really they're desperate to know. I live in a town where we have no testing, hardly. We have hardly any, no surveillance testing whatsoever. The only thing that we have available for protection was what I said in the introduction. We have masking, we have social distancing, we can wash our hands and we have immunity building. That's what we've got. And masking is critical. And they wanna know, what do we do? All right, what do we do if we don't have the access that you have? So let's put this part of the, um, of the program uh, aside or leave it for a moment. And let's let Dr. Bungard now describe his in vivo study which is known around the world now as the Denmark study. Take it away. Yes, <clears throat> you know, during last uh, winter or early spring, uh, when I was sitting watching TV, I saw these many uh, people on the streets wa wearing masks that was mainly from, from Asia. Uh, and as a, um, a scientist, I considered, hang on. Mm. Is that really working? And I looked into the literature and the literature was most certainly not very clear. There have been some studies uh, with 
rather few participants where they have looked at the efficacy in influenza, but also uh, during the SARS and MERS um, uh, epidemics. But the data were mostly based on uh, observational studies. That is not very strong evidence uh, generated from that kind of studies. So we said, okay, um, uh, we need documentation and uh, not least if it's coming that we are going to wear masks, all of us, then uh, it would be very nice to have the documentation, have the arguments for, for why we should wear a mask. So we designed our study and, and I'm a cardiologist and you would say as a cardiologist, what is a cardiologist, professor in cardiology uh, doing on face mask studies? Yeah, basically it's a matter of testing masks exactly the same way as we are testing new drugs. That is, we have a good rational that it works and then we test, does it really work in the real world as we expect it uh, to? So we set up a, um, a trial and uh, we did our uh, power calculations uh, based on assumptions uh, of an uh, efficacy of 50%. Uh, on an assumption that 2% of the Danish population would get infected during the trial period, and the trial period was one month. And uh, we, on this basis, included a total of 6,000 participants, and uh, they were randomized, half to wear a mask, or you could also say were recommended to wear a mask, and half not to. And then <clears throat> uh, the participants... Um, were sent all the material they, they needed. Uh, those who were going to wear masks, they had 50 masks sent for free, high quality masks. Uh, they were also, we also sent um, uh, swap equipment and we sent antibody testing. So they started doing an antibody testing and then they uh, were wearing the masks for a month when they were outside home and we only included adults and those who were actually outside home for at least three hours per day among other people. Um, and then after a month, uh, they tested again, they did the swap uh, and that was returned to us and they did the antibody testing and they were reading it, uh, the antibody testing themselves and putting it into a, a survey. Uh, we did weekly surveys to ensure they were wearing the mask and to what extent, ask to what extent they were doing it. Uh, and they also got instructions of, about how to do the testing. Um, and there was a hotline. So we were in contact with a lot of the participants. So the results were that uh, almost 5,000 of the participants uh, uh, finished the trial. And uh, the results were that in those who were not wearing a mask, 2.1%, uh, were infected during the period. And in the mask group, 1.8% were infected. So that is clearly uh, our expectations of a halving of the infection rate was not met. Uh, so the difference uh, was not statistically significant. And that is basically what I can say came out of it. And then I'm asked again and again, but did you see anything then? Yes, we could see that the OX ratio was 0.8. A two meaning that there seemed to be a potentially small uh, effect size. That is that the infection rate in those wearing a mask was reduced by 15 to 20 percent. But it is very, very important for me to stress that scientifically uh, a effect size and or an effect of that size <clears throat> is so small that the uncertainty is large. That is the effect might be bigger, but it may also be that there's no effect at all of wearing a mask. So that is basically the conclusion. It's important for me to say that what we tested was whether the wearer of the mask was, put, was protected. And we didn't test during um, uh, circumstances where we are not able to uh, keep the distance. Uh, and then most importantly, we didn't test the efficacy of a mask as source control. That is when you are infected yourself. And you can say, why should that be tested? Because if you are infected, you stay at home. No, no. And this is another important point. We know that half or maybe even a bit more than half of those who are infected have no symptoms. That is, 
I may feel well as I do today and be infected and I'm not warned that I can go and uh, pass on the uh, coronavirus uh, to you uh, because I have no symptoms. So I think that wearing a mask is to some extent, maybe a small extent to my benefit, but it's mostly something we do for each other. It's altruistic a thing to do that I am taking care of you uh, by wearing my mask and you're taking care of me by wearing your mask. I think that is a, an important uh, message to send. So if I understand you, Dr. Bungard, you're saying you came away with more confidence that the mask wearer is protecting others than protecting themselves. Yeah. Is that correct? That's the way we see it. And is that what leads you to wear your mask uh, as you do, as you told us earlier, that you wear your mask as you're doing it as a, as a good citizen and, and wanting other citizens to do the same? Most certainly. And, and, I, and I think that it's very, very important that we as good citizens, and, and that term is very, very important for us, that we as good citizens are doing what the authorities are recommending us to do, because that is... That is my small, my individual small contribution to uh, fight this terrible pandemic. Uh, and I think that I, I hate to wear my mask, to be honest. I hate it. Uh, you know, I, I know it from my daily work in, in hospital. So I hate, it, I hate to wear the mask outside. But if, if I will, this small uh, contribution can do something to reduce uh, the duration or the severity of the pandemic, I'm so happy to do to do it. And, and I think most people would be uh, similarly. Well, if I may take an aside to say that your country is well known for being an extremely cooperative country, I think your happiness ratio is the highest happiness ratio <laughs> on the planet. I, I think that is well known. And I also think it's well known that uh, in answer to the question, do you feel that your government is representing you? Uh, the Danes have the uh, highest percentage on the planet of people who say yes. I think your percentage is well up into the 90s, which is uh, extremely admirable. Uh, Creon, you have something to say, please. I have a funny thing and then a question. And, and I just imagine how happy the Danish would be read, would be listed as if it wasn't so dark all winter long. I mean, the fact that they can be the happiest country on earth when half of them have seasonal affective disorder depression is just even more amazing, okay? So anyway, my question was, I did. I, I think I detected a disconnect in something that was said between you and Richard, and I'm not sure. Your study, Dan Mask, checked for uh, protection of masks, given all the protocols and caveats. Yeah. Masks as a protective uh, device for the mask wearer to prevent infection. And then Richard went and said something like, but, but, uh, but Dr. Bungard, so your study has now given you much greater confidence that masks are good for source control, but your study did not test source control. So I just wanna straighten that out. If, if you have high confidence that masks, while they may not protect the wearer, protect the people the wearer comes in contact with, how, where is that evidence? Who did that study? Uh, the, the study on source control uh, is only the study, or basically only the study, to the best of my knowledge, from the laboratories, as I referred to before, where you are having a, an infected person that is coughing or sneezing or talking loudly into the mask, and you can see a lot of virus on the inside of the mask afterwards. Um, you, you say, you, I've been asked time and time again uh, why we didn't do the quote-unquote right study that would be the source control study um, and people have told us again and again you missed out um, and imagine how that could be done that would one example would be that you could take people who have just been told they are infected after a swab test and then you would randomize them to wear a mask or not to wear a mask and then during the next days or weeks you would go in their the participants' houses and where they work and shops and trains and buses and ask or check how many got infected by those who were wearing a mask or, uh, in opposite to those who were not wearing a mask. 
And for very obvious reasons, ethical reasons, you cannot do that study. You could then do uh, studies where you did cluster randomization. That is, you randomized one city to wear a mask and the other city not to wear a mask. And then you, you shouldn't just randomize two cities, but you should randomize a number of cities. But that would be tricky because then you would have to tell the, 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 the citizens, you are not allowed to wear a mask because if those who were not wearing mask, if half were still wearing a mask, then it would be difficult to learn much from the study and vice versa. So that would be a tricky study to do. So I think we have to say that we get the indirect evidence from laboratory findings and that's how it's going to be. Uh, it's not going to be much better. Uh, but maybe so, some others may have ideas to how to solve that problem. Uh, I'm going to uh, read a couple of questions from uh, listeners, which I think you're uh, already addressing, but I'd like to uh, give them the respect of reading it. Uh, Jen in San Francisco says, with a 99% SARS uh, uh, COVID-19 survival rate and no 99.9 percent, she quotes, survival rate, and no conclusive evidence of mask efficacy. Why would you recommend uh, wearing a, a mask with with such a, an extreme downside? And she says the downside is uh, uh, psychological effects on children, hypoxia, loss of constitutional rights, etc. Well, I think you, you you've uh, you've addressed that. Uh, if you want to say more about it, fine. And then we have a question from Emma in Berkeley, California, uh, and she, if she's aiming this one at you, Dr. Bungard. Uh, can you propose a, a study design that might be able to show that masks protect others? And I think you've been, you've been, uh, you know, you've been talking about that. But I, I wanted to read that on air, uh, Dr. Bungard. Your study. Uh, one of the comments that's been made about it, and I'm sure you've heard, but I'd like you to discuss it on air, please. Is that uh, there were few controls on the mask wearers in terms of their daily behavior. In other words, what do we know about to what extent they actually wore the masks? And what do we know to what extent they wore them properly the same way you and Dr. Westman know to wear your masks? And to what do we know to what extent they took them off or didn't take them off? Uh, for example, the, there's a famous, uh, uh, I don't know if it was a study or a finding here in the United States, where they were trying to figure out why is it that hospital workers at, at certain hospitals were getting such a high infection rate when they were being followed and they were wearing their masks everywhere. And they couldn't figure it out until somebody went into the lunchroom and discovered that when they went into the lunchroom, they, uh, they, they took off their masks and sat around and had sandwiches and drinks. And so the lunchroom, as it turns out, was the hot spot where they were getting infected. Well, that is going to apply to your study as well. You've got 3,000 people. You certainly didn't have 3,000 people following them and watching them, their, their behavior. So in effect, how do we know what they really did? That's the question for your study that I hear a lot and I'd like to pose to you, please. <clears throat> yes. Um... We, first of all, we instructed them how to take on and take off the mask. And then second, uh, on a weekly basis during the four week study, we asked them uh, and the questions were, did you wear the mask completely as instructed? Or did you wear the mask uh, almost completely as instructed? Or didn't you wear the mask? And 46% said, completely as instructed, 47 said uh, almost, and seven said no. And then we did <clears throat> sensitivity analysis, and that is reported in, in the paper in Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, sensitivity analysis where we were looking at, uh, if we excluded those who said they did not wear a mask, the 7%, and if we exclude those who said partially, and there were no differences. There were no differences. And, and that, this is a very uh, interesting and, and, and also a very important uh, question because I'm sure that these participants were wearing a mask at least as well as most people are out in the community right now. Actually, I think they are doing it a bit better because they were, they were instructed 
they were followed, they were encouraged, and they had masks free of charge delivered by us, and it was high quality masks. So all this combined, I think that here we were taught that you could you can get so much out of the mask and probably not that much more. Creon has a question for you, Dr. Bungard, but before he does, one quick question from me, which is, please, and then, yeah, I see your hand there, Nicholas. Um, when you, please give us an operational definition of high quality in high quality mask. Uh, what we consider a high quality mask was a surgical face mask with a 98% filtration rate. Thank you kindly. Creon? Um, yeah, um, I wanted to ask one more question about your study, which might bring up a topic for some of the remaining time we have, or maybe we defer it to a future podcast, which of course that's up to you. Uh, but the, what I'd like to ask is, the um, when you talk about the infection rate, um, there you are testing for quote unquote infection in certain ways. Could you review for us uh, the, the nature of the testing that you did with your populations before, during and after, and if there was any, like, how can I say this? Uh, what happens if you get a positive, do you retest, et cetera? Yeah, okay. First, when, when, we, um, when the study started, they were tested using antibodies. And those who had a positive antibody test were not in the final analysis, they were excluded. Then, uh, at the end of the study, we could just have used uh, the swab test, but that would be a problem because they, <clears throat> a, a participant might have been uh, going into the trial and two days later got infected. And during the next two weeks, he might have cleared his infection. And then uh, when the study ended four weeks or two weeks later, then he would be a negative person. So we needed an accumulative method to count in all those who had been infected during the study period. And that is antibody testing. Antibody testing using uh, IgM and IgG. So that was uh, the reason why we combined these two uh, to make sure that we really caught uh, all of them. And, and on that note, uh, many of you have probably also seen that people have asked but the infection rate in Denmark overall was small during that period of time. Yes, that's right. Uh, but the official um, uh, numbers are only based on PCR. They are not based, that is uh, on swab testing. They're not based on antibodies. So, so you can't compare these numbers. That's an important point. Does that answer your question? Well, the whole question about PCR versus antibodies versus antigens and cycle thresholds and um, primer sequences and all this stuff is a really big issue, which I think we will save probably for another another session. But um, thank you for explaining the protocol. I understand it. And Nicholas, you have a question. I had Comment. two uh, two two questions really. Um, the first was um, you mentioned that people in the study, the the test group. Or, and the control group had to leave the house for at least three hours a day. Uh, was there any attempt to uh, kind of quantify that? So if a person's out for three hours, they have a very different exposure than somebody who's out for eight hours, 10 hours, uh, or is that just kind of a, a threshold? That's the first question. Is there any way that your data can uh, tease out the duration of exposure to the outside world. And, and the second, uh, did you control for any uh, exposure to virus within the household itself? So when these people come home at night, they presumably have family members, children, spouses, and so on, who are not part of the study and may introduce the virus into their uh, environment. Is there any attempt made to control that route of exposure? These are two extremely good questions. The first question <clears throat> um, is that we, or uh, the first answer is that we ask the participants how many hours they spent outside. And there was, they spent a median of 4.5 hours uh, a day uh, outside home. And that was uh, weekdays and uh, weekend days, 4.5 hours uh, in median. And we looked in, in our forest plot uh, comparing those who were below 
the median and those who were above the median. And we couldn't see a significant uh, interaction. There was a, a trend, but not a significant interaction between uh, these two. Um, then uh, uh, we have been asked before, but you wear a mask when you are outdoor, but you uh, get infected from those in your household. Um, and I think that is going to be the way it's going to be because we can never imagine that we are going to wear a mask in at uh, our house uh, or at home. Uh, any of us, we that would be terrible to wear a mask as, as well at home. But but we asked the participants have. Have there been anyone in your household that have had the diagnosis of COVID-19? And there were roughly 40 in each group reporting that had happened during the period. And uh, two in the mask group and one in the non-mask group of these reached an outcome. That is, were infected or had an infection. And then the, the next question is, yes, but that was the household members that were diagnosed, would might there have been asymptomatic household members? And that is, of course, there might have been uh, asymptomatic household members. We couldn't tell. Uh, we don't know. And that is, of course, uh, a potential uh, limitation. Thank you. And I would just like to uh, just clarify here that I think we're talking about the efficacy, the physical efficacy of a mask itself versus adherence to a protocol to proper use of the mask. I think we would all agree that a physical barrier between an aerosol containing a virus uh, and another person is going to prevent transmission. So as an example, the, the boy in the bubble syndrome, where these children uh, have an immunodeficiency disease and must be kept in a germ-free environment uh, in order to prevent them becoming infected uh, while awaiting, say, a bone marrow transplant. We know that that works. Now, if someone compromises the bubble by accidentally poking a hole in it or entering the bubble uh, with an infectious disease and that person inside gets infected, it's not the fault of the bubble. It doesn't mean that the bubble doesn't work. It just means that the, the procedure was compromised. And so I'd like to make sure that we stay, that we make that distinction in our discussion of masks. Uh, it, I mean, we live in a physical world and uh, unless there's some magical way that particles can uh, uh, translate through a solid object, which I'm uh, unaware of, then clearly any failure of masks to work is due to either poor education or poor uh, adherence or poor uh, employment of the proper procedure. And I think that's a very different question. And I think that the uh, approach to solving that is very different. We don't necessarily need better masks. We need better education, I believe. I totally disagree, Nick. I've got to say it. Um, a mask is not a bubble. Even an N95 mask, if used correctly, and if you believe the Staphylococcus test also translates to the viral uh, aerosol test, is 95% effective if everything's perfect. Don't try to say that a boy in a bubble is an average person wearing a surgical mask. It's a totally different situation. And you know darn well that, that a lot of the air is coming through the sides and all kinds of other things for a surgical mask. And we have no idea actually at this point in time, although we would like to think, we always like to say common sense. We don't know if one, if like with measles, one virus can infect you. Okay, and so cutting out 95% of them doesn't necessarily work. So I have to take issue with everything you said, trying to blame it when, when it, a study comes and it says masks don't help. And then people just say, oh, well, the people just have to mask up harder because if they use them correctly, they'd be 100% effective. Absolutely not. Now, if you're gonna sit inside of a moon suit like they use in a level four bio lab, that's probably pretty darn close to 100% effective. And if you screw that up and puncture it, you know, you've got problems. But the idea that a mask, that a surgical mask correctly used is a moon suit and that all problems with uh, mask failure to uh, prevent spread is compliance problems, I have to disagree respectfully. Dr. Bungard? I, th I think, <clears throat> I think you, you basically say the same because, you know, 
the 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 mask has, and I'm sure Korean, you 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 agree, the mask has a rational, and there will be virus sitting on the outside and on the inside of the mask. But if you are touching, if you're touching the mask a lot of times, and actually studies from studies from the hospital uh, from hospitals have shown that uh, that was medical students that they are actually touching the face mask or the face every second minute with a mask on. So, so if, if you look at the mask and you are wearing it optimally, comparing to what we are as uh, human beings doing and we are not behaving optimally, but if we are taught and if we are going to put a lot of effort into doing it better, I think we can gain uh, more from the mask as compared to um, uh, what we what we think, and it, Korean, it, it's also very important to say that you are probably not infected by one virus. Uh, there are studies or indications that you need probably a load of uh, around 300 viruses uh, to get infected if you are a healthy person. Uh, I'm not sure about these numbers. SARS-CoV-2. I was talking about measles. I mean, there are viruses that are more virulent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. But but we the the message I'm trying to convey is that uh, if the mask is used, it's, I agree with you, it's most certainly not 100%, it's something less because there are a lot of uh, air coming in around the mask, but we are losing some of the efficacy because we are not doing as uh, we should do. We are touching our face, we are touching the mask, uh, we are forgetting to uh, take it, taking it on uh, when we are just sitting in the restaurant going for uh, a new glass and we walk up there and we have been so good until then but we just forgot it and you met the guy who actually transmitted the uh, virus to you. Dr. Westman you were going to comment on the number of molecules necessary in order to uh, get an infection I saw you. Uh... Right I was just going to agree that the number is not known but it's more than one. <laughs> it's more than one. Mean, it seems the dose matters of coronavirus so that the higher the dose, possibly the worse the infection. So as I said earlier, you both agree that there is a, a matter of duration and intensity, how yeah. intense the number of molecules are in your environment and how long you're in that environment with that level of intensity. I, think uh, I just got to make uh, just a comment. Just one sec, we... one second, Nick. Let me allow me to cut you off because I just got a note from our producer, Charlie Dice, and he wants to know uh, if you are all uh, uh, available to continue the discussion for, we're, we're now beyond an hour. Uh, does, do your schedules permit you to continue for uh, uh, 10 minutes more or so? Uh, Dr. Westman, yes. Uh, Dr. Bungard, you can continue. Dr. Cosi, can you continue? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Levitt or Creon, can you continue? Okay, we're good. Now, uh, uh, Nicholas, you wanted to comment. Well, I just wanted to respond to uh, Creon. I, 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 I don't think he's saying, and I, I hope he's not saying that wearing a mask is equivalent to not wearing a mask. In other words, if a person is in a room with an infected person, that person is talking, breathing, whatever, and nobody's wearing masks, that that's the same situation as somebody who's wearing a mask, perhaps ineffectively, uh, but in my mind, I don't, I don't quite understand uh, the equivalence. Uh, it seems that there is a, what we're getting conflated here is things like personal freedoms and things like that, which really have nothing to do with the science uh, behind the masks. Uh, as I think uh, uh, Dr. Bundegaard alluded to earlier, there are certain types of studies that are unethical to do and will never be done. There'll never be a controlled clinical study exposing people to coronavirus with and without masks. It's just simply unethical. So we're left with epidemiological studies. These are observational studies uh, that attempt to draw conclusions uh, in, in, in typically, and even as, as Dr. Bundegaard uh, described, it, it, there were, you know, they tried to control as much as they could, but uh, clearly uh, these, the people were not monitored 24-7. They relied on personal uh, uh, descriptions of whether or not they were compliant and 
you know, described that, you know, less than 50% of the people actually followed the instructions. Uh, and, and so I, I, I feel like we're, I, I mean, I think it's a great that we're, we're moving in this direction. We clearly need more data, but um, I think I'll just leave it at that. I just want to make sure that Creon is not saying that no mask is the same thing as wearing a mask. No, I'm saying that a mask is not a biohazard moon suit. A mask, I agree, a mask. sure, of and course. If even if it's correctly worn, you know, it apparently doesn't have a big effect on protecting you, which is what Dr. Bungard's study shows. Now, is, does it have a big effect on protecting someone else? Indirect evidence may suggest it. It may be the courteous and right thing to do it, just because of the precautionary principle. But until someone comes along with a, a study, a clinical study somehow that shows that um, some masks are effective at source control. I mean, we don't have to do, jump into the system now, but I do want to mention, and maybe some of these mask experts can give a, a feedback on this. In the operating room, it doesn't look so good. You're a cardiologist, you wear a mask in the operating room. Have you ever read any of the numerous studies that show that masks in the operating room do not protect the patient against infections? It's shocking. Do you agree with that, Dr. Westman? I, I haven't I haven't read those articles directly, but we're getting into the the issue that I, the, the uh, listener from San Francisco uh, brought up, which is the likelihood. I want the likelihood to be zero, not not just one percent. I you know so when you apply, you, I can't believe that there's a surgical study with enough power to say these people had masks, these people didn't have masks. We did 1,000, 2,000 operations and the, the infections weren't different. No, I want zero infections. So well, they, <laughs> actually, did, yet they did thousands of operations. They randomized, it was Danish by the way, and there's been many follow-ups. They did thousands of operations. They randomized the days in the hospital when, this, when the operating people, the people in the theater used masks versus when they didn't. And they actually found more infections in the people who were operated on when the, when everyone was wearing a mask. Right. And I'm well, happy but, to but time out. Did they when they coughed? Did they turn to the side when they when they had a, a, a sickness? So again, thousands is not enough. We do millions of operations. So this is why you're, you're not going to have any. You understand thousands. the concept of power. Yeah. Thousands might be enough for the statistical power, and I presume they kept everything constant in terms of their other procedures, or else it was a mess up, right? No, we, we want it to be zero. Not, not so anyway. Let me get position. back to the, the San Francisco question. Yeah. Point, point one percent in the U.S. Three hundred fifty million people is three hundred fifty thousand people that will die. So the idea that it's a, most people are fine. That, no, you look at other countries that have used masks as part of the whole strategy. They have 10,000 deaths. We have, so, so to, to take away, <laughs> um, it's like, if you know how to build a bridge, build a bridge in an emergency, don't start trying to tinker with what are the essential components you need to build a bridge. So actually, Kriana, I love that you're coming to this with the, the scientists a true scientist mind, but this is not true science. This is human behavior. This is uh, the um, randomized trials are not perfect. And Dr. Bungard, I've read your study because it's being used to say masks don't work like Creon has been saying, and it didn't say that at all. So when half the people use the masks and they weren't really taught how to do it, and, and we really only, we were expecting a 50% reduction in the event rate, that's a huge effect size. So I'm used to clinical trials where 50,000 people are randomized to show the effect of a drug to, because they have so much money involved, they want to show the difference from eight to 7%. So be careful with the, the insufficient knowledge of poorly powered randomized trials. That's the end of my lecture. Yeah, and I, you've said something about uh, Dr. Bunga, the famous Danish study that I want to come back to which uh, Dr. Bungard, you, you well know, which is that anti-maskers around the world are using your, uh, your study. They've politicized your study. Uh, it's it's uh, grown, that, that whole movement has grown enormously. 
And, uh, and that's part of why in my introduction, I pointed out that you yourself advocated for the use of masks. And we've heard you say it on this program as well, uh, if for no other reason than the great reason of altruism to take care of your fellow uh, you know, citizens. Um, and I think it's very important, and I'm gonna use this time to, to make that uh, point and, and underline it in red. I think it's very important that you stay out in public and you make it very clear uh, what you've made clear to our listeners today so that you undermine to whatever extent possible the politicization of your study. Uh, it's really, it's being used as a hammer, if I may use that, it really is. Uh, and uh, Dr. Westman is correct. Uh, and it's dangerous uh, for that reason because uh, using your study as a hammer against masks is, is, uh, is totally undermining the good citizen approach that you and your country stand for and you advocate. And, and it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, but uh, you know what's going on and what has been going on in our country. And it's a very sad state of affairs where protecting human beings or not protecting human beings has become politicized. And so rather than listening to science and, and, and listening to, to, uh, to experienced uh, scientists and, and, and people you know, in the field like yourselves, uh, people listening to politicians for advice on how to protect themselves. It's almost institutionalized madness and we need to do something about it because you, know, you see what's going on in our United States. The infection rate is, is escalating uh, at an alarming rate. Yes, Dr. Gunberg, please uh, respond. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for, for these very nice comments. Uh, I think that politicians uh, have been struggling because how would they know? Um, last week, uh, our parliament invited me uh, to tell about our study and uh, the way we see it. And, and when I left the parliament on my way out to the meeting, they said, thank you so much. We were so much in doubt. We didn't know where to go to, to get the knowledge that we should base on our recommendations on. Uh, of course, we have the National Board of Health, but what about our own opinion? How can we uh, build our own opinion to uh, differentiate between the opportunities the National Board of Health uh, put uh, forward us, to us. Now we know a lot more. So, so maybe, you know, as physicians, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Westman, you, you know what I'm talking about when uh, the patients are coming asking us uh, about so many things that are so relevant. How do I protect myself? How do I protect my sick kid, how do I protect my husband or my wife uh, who, for whom COVID-19 might be uh, lethal? Um, how do I do this? And the politicians are asked and they are used to have the answer, uh, but where to get the, all that knowledge from? And we didn't have the knowledge. We are building up the knowledge uh, from studies like uh, Dr. Westman's and, and the Danish study. Uh, and, and I think that misusing the, uh, the evidence is really a pity, uh, uh, but discussions and uh, in, uh, formative uh, programs like your uh, program, Richard, uh, are very, very important. Dr. Westman, I wanna come back to something you said because it's something that I hear about a great deal. And that is having to do with things called gators and bandanas. And the word on the street uh, it varies. Some people think that they can wear a gaiter and a bandana and it's doing as good as any mask because after all, it's an obstruction. And then there are some of those like myself who have read your study, possibly misinterpreted it. So I wanna clarify it right now. I read your study and came away with the impression that a one layer of cotton, such as a gator or a bandana, breaks the water molecule that the COVID-19 is piggybacking on into a smaller molecule, thereby allowing it to get through uh, at a greater number than a larger molecule, which is filtered. And therefore, the, since the gator does that, it breaks the molecule or the, or the bandana, uh, it actually makes the bandana or the gator possibly 
m more dangerous or less effective than nothing whatsoever, and that anything less than something that approaches three layers of cotton is going to have much less efficacy. Would you comment and please clarify that for our listeners? Sure. So what we saw in the, remember the laser going across a black box is that if there was one layer of a bandana or a neck gaiter, it was a, it was one layer, one layer neck gaiter. So other neck gaiters that have more layers might not work this way. But what we saw is more particles in the box. And uh, now this has been, we've received informal uh, criticism through the internet and, and news media <laughs> that, that what we saw might not represent a worsening in infection. It might be just a, a physical change. So it, we, the key to what you said is possible. And, and that's what we said is possible. Uh, and I'd also like to say that I'd love to have other people try to replicate what we did and, or, and refute uh, what we did, because um, I think it just goes, what, now we have the months of the feedback, the take home point is that a single layer that you can see through or breathe through easily, blow through, is not affording you nearly as much protection. I don't know that it's worsening it. Uh, that would require a replication of the study and, uh, and, you know, kind of like Dr. Bungard, the, you have no control over how other people use your study. And we had no intent of just saying that net gators were bad. And, you know, what we wanted to say, the big picture view is that you spew out particles when you speak and you can block those by wearing a simple face covering. So I'm about to uh, bring the uh, program to a conclusion and I'm gonna make a final statement. Before I do, I invite uh, any of you who wish to, to make a final statement. Um, yes, please, Dr. Westman and Dr. Bungard, I, I, I appreciate and look forward to your comments. Yeah, so, so I bring, you know, uh, internal medicine training in a US medical school and living in a world where I go to a clinic, I see patients and, and, and I go out into the world. I assume everyone outside my family circle has the disease. I, I'm using that as not fear, I'm not afraid, I'm just assuming everyone has the infection. I wear a mask when I go out and I'm silent or speak very softly when I'm around other people outside my family circle as common etiquette because I know having been in front of a box that when I speak, stuff comes out of my mouth. Uh, and uh, I think the last thing is to take this time to improve your metabolic health. So the, the people who get ill and, and suffer a lot from this disease are those who are already ill with diabetes and other metabolic uh, problems. And uh, that is, take that time just in case, but try to prevent, I, I wanna prevent me getting it here uh, as much as I can, thus I'm gonna have a little bit of inconvenience uh, and um, you can improve your health while uh, time is kind of on a standstill. Thank you. Dr. Bungard? There's one uh, issue that I've not touched on, and that is that one question I, I often hear from my heart uh, patients is that, can I just wear a mask and then get out of my insulation, uh, go to shops and uh, see my grandchildren or friends? Um, and based on our study, I think that the message to these patients those who are particularly concerned or at high risk is, no, you can't. Uh, the mask per se is not enough. You have to be very careful using all the other means as well, mainly social distancing, uh, hand hygiene, hygiene, sneezing in your uh, elbow and all the other things. Uh, you have to be very careful. It's not just a matter of wearing a mask and you are safe. Krian, any last comment? I just want to thank everyone for participating. This is fascinating. I hope it didn't come off as too uh, contrarian. I think the real interesting juice, and, and by the way, Dr. Westman, uh, you and I totally agree on, on uh, uh, very low carb, high fat diets. I, I know that. <laughs> I've looked into your background, so cheers for that. Uh, anyway, I, I, um, I think the real interesting juice is to be found for those interested like us in this strange area where we have um, 
laboratory studies and simulations and, and experiments with lasers that say that masks seem like they should be effective. And then we have real world studies, many, many of them over the years, not with COVID, but with all kinds of other viruses and infections that show that masks aren't very effective. And what's interesting to me is how we rectify those two things. What are we getting wrong you know, in our understanding or in our usage? And I'm talking about masks in healthcare situations where people are trained how to use them and they have an adequate supply. So where I'm interested in is how to rectify these two different things, not arguing about who's right, I think we're, they're both right. I think they should work according to like laboratory and common sense, but they don't seem to work. And I'm really interested in what's going on. Thank you. Dr. Cozy. Oh, I want to thank everyone and, and thank you, uh, Dr. Miller, for the opportunity uh, to participate in this. And really what I come away from is uh, that we really need a multi-factorial approach. Uh, it's, it's clear that, you know, having some sort of barrier seems it would be a benefit. Having good nutrition would be a benefit. Practicing good hygiene would be a benefit. And I think if we do all of these things together, we can at least, uh, it, it, well, prudence demands that we uh, not be too cavalier about it. And I think that, uh, Sometimes, like, as you mentioned earlier, things get politicized. If we just stick with the science alone, uh, I, I think that can give us some good guidance. Um, and uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, be, be safe, be well, uh, uh, take whatever precautions you feel are necessary. And I, just one final comment is that the outcomes of this disease are potentially lethal. It's not something that's just a matter of opinion, like whether I say tomato or you say tomato, it doesn't ma ma make any difference. But in this case, where someone else's health might be at risk because of one's own behaviors, I think we, it's incumbent upon us to look out for the other person and do what we can, even absent any you know, ironclad uh, uh, experiment that 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 proves us beyond a shadow of a doubt. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listeners, what's your takeaway? I'll tell you what my takeaway is. I've been practicing clinical psychology for over 50 years. I think I'm pretty good at reading people. I believe that the four men who are on this program with me today are honest men. I'm looking into their eyes for now an hour and 25 minutes, really close on a Zoom. You can see a lot more on a Zoom actually than I can see of my patients across the room because the Zoom is up so close. You're listening to men of integrity who spend their lives in science and helping other people. I've read the Danish study. I've read the Duke physics study. You're being given facts. You're given, being given facts by people who have integrity. My takeaway from these facts today are as follows. Of course, build up your immunity. That's a no-brainer to use that vernacular. Build up your immunity, of course. Wear a mask, whether it's controversial or not with regard to whether it blocks material coming in you heard it's not controversial with regard to material going out, and it's incumbent upon all of us to be good Danes, namely to be good citizens. Let, it, let us follow their example that they set for the world, because they are the happiest people on the planet. All studies have shown us that. So wear a mask. There's no, no, there is no question that social distancing is effective. You know that. The further away you are from something flying, the safer you are. Not much to figure out. So we have, yes, build up your immunity. Yes, wear a mask. Yes, socially distance. Yes, wash your hands. And yes, those of you who are at high risk, those of you who have comorbidities, you've got to be even more careful, even more careful. And if that means the terrible inconvenience of not being so close to friends and family for a period of time, that's what's being recommended. You don't want to do it. It's your life. 
you're at risk. But if you want to take risk, please don't risk other people's lives by being cavalier with what you may be carrying. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Cozy, Mr. Levitt, Nicholas, Creon. Thank you, Dr. Westman. Eric, I'm so glad you were with us today. Thank you, Dr. Bungard. Heming, I hope you'll both come back because we have more to talk about. And thank you all to, to listening for today's uh, program of Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. And I want to give special thanks to my producer, Charlie Deist, who had his hands full today when we had those technical problems in the beginning, and he did a darn good job at getting me back on the air. Uh, this pretty seeding program was brought to you by Wilbur Hot Springs and Thanksgiving Coffee. You know, the autumn season is magnificent at Wilbur Hot Springs. It's a wonderful place to get away and revitalize. I know you'll enjoy taking the waters and hiking in the 1,500-acre nature preserve. I would love to have a meeting with the four scientists who are here today at Wilbur Hot Springs. It would be a great place to continue the discussion. You'll find plenty of lodging there, cozy cabins. It's truly a health sanctuary. Book, book yourself today at wilburhotsprings.com. I'll tell you something uh, personal. Uh, we have a little chicken farm where I live here in Fort Bragg, California, uh, on the North Coast, uh, called the JNR Farm, and we produce the world's best organic eggs. At least I think so. Our chickens live a, love, a life of love and eat the finest food, free range and organic. And because the eggs are so good, we're able to trade them for the world's best gourmet coffee from the Thanksgiving Coffee Company. I only drink Thanksgiving coffee because it's the best and, of course, because I can trade my eggs. The founder of Thanksgiving Coffee, Paul Katzif, is a social worker and a political activist who has improved the lives of millions of coffee growers around the world by bringing them some of the actual money that is made in, in, in coffee. Before that, they were literally starving, and Paul has gone around the world helping these people. Paul and I have mutual admiration. We were born in the same hospital in the Bronx, New York. We just discovered that recently. He appreciates and supports mind, body, health, and politics. And what has he done? He created three special mind, body, health, and politics coffee blends. Then he doubles down and donates 20% of internet sales of these three special blends to the COVID response network. It's a 501c3 that I helped start with a few friends to protect people here on the North Coast. We're doing our utmost to get people to do what you've heard here on the program today, to wear masks, socially distance, wash their hands, and build their immunity. I'm going to say it again, build their immunity. Uh, and by the way, you want to read something about uh, Dr. Westman's work, go to Google, because what, uh, what Creon was, uh, was referencing is very important because of, of Dr. Westman's work on the keto diet. So go to the Thanksgiving Coffee Company website, buy Mind, Body, Health, and Politics coffee, support the truth-telling broadcast this program brings you, and support people here on the North Coast. Please buy it now. I'd like you to join me next Tuesday at nine o'clock Pacific Standard Time for our next stimulating broadcast. And until then, this is Dr. Richard Lewis Miller reminding you that good health is worth fighting for, and it's essential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs>